Nail care and art is a massive industry today in the United States, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, 150 years ago, many Americans had never heard of a manicure, let alone had one. So where did the multi-billion dollar nail business we have today come from? Hi, I'm Julie and I'm a business historian. And today I'm talking about Cutex, the brand that convinced Americans to manicure and paint their nails. Nail care is a practice that dates back thousands of years. Buried among the royal tombs at Or in Mesopotamia was a manicure set, dating back to the 3rd millennium BCE. In North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and South Asia, fingertips were sometimes dyed using the henna plants. And in China and Korea, nails were soaked overnight in balsam flowers and alum until they were tinted red. In the 1870s, Americans became aware of a popular practice in France that was reportedly unknown in the United States, the manicure. Newspapers reported, in France, particularly in all the large cities, the women in nearly all classes take particular pains with their hands. So much so that they regularly go to what is called a manicure, that is, person who makes the care of the hands a specialty. It wasn't long before manicure parlors were opened in New York City and Boston, and then spread across the country as cities like Chicago and San Francisco followed suit. Manicure parlors in the U.S. attracted women and men from aristocratic families as well as bankers, brokers, and merchants. There, a manicure, or what we would now call a manicuress, cleaned and softened the hands and treated water, trimmed and shaped the nails with a file, and used curved scissors or a sharp tool to remove the ragged edges of the cuticle. Then the manicure applied a tinted pomade and polished the nails. In contrast to what we think of as nail polish today, the nail polish was actually a polish, a powder that was rubbed into the nails until they shined. At first, manicures were a fashionable fad reserved for the wealthy. But once more parlors opened, prices decreased to as low as 25 cents, and regular visits to see a manicure became an affordable luxury. As manicures became more popular, it seemed the natural next step was for consumers to attempt nail care themselves. Manicure sets for home use quickly became available. In 1895, Harper's Bazaar magazine noted, There is no reason why every woman should not be able herself to keep her hands and nails in proper condition. The various implements, lotions, polishes, powders, and acids used by the professionals are for sale in all the shops. And after having her hands carefully manicured half a dozen times by a skillful manicure, the tricks of the trade are easily learned. Now, despite these assertions, reportedly only 25% of women in the U.S. were using manicure products at home. Most consumers who wanted and could afford a manicure went to a professional. At the time, a manicure was a tedious multi-step process. And some steps, like trimming the cuticle, required expert care. A slip of the scissors could cut into the quick, the seal that protects the nail bed. Now, not only was such a mishap extremely painful, it could also lead to serious infections. Cutting the cuticle became the inspiration for a young man named Northam Warren. Warren worked for Park Davis & Co, but wanted to go into business for himself. He went to a business friend for advice who told him, get up to something new. There is no lack of soap, shaving accessories, tooth powders, cream, salves, lotions, face powders, and toilet articles of all kind and to spare. Do not imitate some product already on the market. If you want to do something really worthwhile, go out and invent something new. Warren was discouraged. His entire work experience had been in the drug and cosmetics trade. Every time he tried to think of something new, he failed. But as Warren later recalled, Had I followed the so-called path of least resistance, I might have added another dental cream to the large number already on the market and missed the bigger opportunity that was waiting for someone to develop. Finally, Warren considered inventing something for the fingernails. At first glance, the professional manicurist used very few tools in their work and didn't seem to need any more. But while watching the manicuring process, Warren saw an opportunity. What if he made something that could remove the surplus cuticle from the fingernail that would eliminate the potentially painful and dangerous use of scissors? The result was Cutex, a chemical cuticle remover which Norpam Warren introduced in 1911. 
Now, according to design historian Kate Ford, who has done extensive research on Qtex's advertising, Qtex was less of a new invention and more of an adaptation of an existing product that was already in use by chiropodists, more commonly known as podiatrists in the US today. Warren recognized the manicuring possibilities of this chiropody product and branded it as Qtex. Now, Northam Warren faced an uphill battle when he introduced Qtex. There is very little demand for a cuticle remover or any other kind of home manicure product. Drugstores who had generally perceived manicure products as low sellers were not interested in stocking Qtex. If Warren wanted Qtex to be a success, he first needed to create consumer demand for home manicures. Ironically, Warren started building the market for home manicure products through professional manicurists themselves. Warren knew that anyone who took more than the most minimal care of their nails likely went to a manicure parlor. If he could get manicurists to use and recommend Qtex to their clients for their own use at home, that would put Qtex, as Warren said, on the high road to success. Asking a manicurist to use and sell a product intended for amateurs was counterintuitive and Warren knew it. When recommending manicure products for use at home, discourage customers from going to a professional manicure parlor and thus endanger the manicurist business. Warren got around this issue by convincing manicurists that this could be a win-win situation. If clients use Qtex at home regularly, then their nails would be in better condition and that would make the manicurist's job faster and easier. And if manicurists use Qtex in their own work, each manicure would take less time and more clients could be seen. The next major hurdle for Qtex was reaching the consumers who had never set foot in a manicure parlor. For these consumers, Warren needed to convince them that nail care was as essential as taking care of your teeth or skin or hair. And so, in the mid-1910s, Warren poured all the money he could, approximately $40,000, into a national advertising campaign. The initial advertising appeared in newspapers and magazines and labeled Qtex the new way to manicure and warned consumers against the ruinous cutting of the cuticle. At first, these advertisements were more focused on Qtex cuticle remover itself, going into great detail about how to use Qtex and emphasizing that it was an absolutely harmless product that had been extensively tested. But Warren and his marketing team soon shifted tactics. Instead of focusing on Qtex, the ads emphasized the social consequences of poorly groomed nails. Do you realize how often eyes are fastened on your nails? Are you willing to be judged by their appearance? And five years ago, manicuring was a social nicety. But today, well-groomed hands are a social and business necessity. Unkempt nails cannot pass muster either in society or in business any more than neglected teeth or untidy hair and are criticized just as severely. These ads made unmanicured nails something to be ashamed of and presented Qtex as the easy way to achieve the perfect hands society required. These early ad campaigns were at a tipping point for Qtex. At the time, Norfam Warren's company was small. Warren took a huge risk in investing so much money into advertising, but it was a risk that paid off. Public interest in home manicuring began to increase. Manicure products, which had been previously relegated to the notions or novelty sections of stores, had been deemed worthy of moving into the cosmetics and toiletry departments. And with few competitors and growing name recognition, Northam Warren's business grew from one small room to an entire building within just a few years. From that moment on, advertising was key to Qtex's success. And the Northam Warren company made increasingly large investments in advertising each year, from $40,000 to half a million in 1920. But ultimately, Qtex's advertising would get it into trouble with the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC. Celebrity testimonials and endorsements had been a major part of Qtex's advertisements since the 1910s. Stars of the stage and silent film appeared in Qtex's ads with such quotes as, I don't see how I ever tolerated having my cuticle cut. Qtex makes my nails look so much better. And one cannot know of Qtex and not love to use it. Qtex keeps my nails looking so beautiful, my friends often remark it. 
But it wasn't until the late 1920s and early 1930s that Qtex's advertising tactics came under fire. In 1928, Qtex advertisements featured endorsements by several socialites and celebrities, perhaps most notably the actress Ethel Barrymore, the aunt of John Barrymore, and the great aunt of Drew Barrymore. Each celebrity was paid for their endorsements. Ethel Barrymore's testimonial earned her $1,000, or about $17,000 in today's money. The Federal Trade Commission, which had been established in 1914 to prevent unfair business practices, took exception to these endorsements. In 1931, the FTC ordered Qtex to cease and desist using paid testimonials, unless the ad disclosed the payment. It asserted that the celebrity endorsements had created unfair competition, stating, In truth and in fact, the alleged author of the testimonial was not a faithful or constant user of said Qtex liquid polish, and the said testimonial was obtained from her by respondent in consideration of the payment of a large sum of money. Now by this point, Norfham Warren had already voluntarily discontinued using paid testimonials, but the company decided to appeal the FTC's order anyway. In 1932, the US Court of Appeals ruled in Norfham Warren's favor, noting, It is doubtful if the public is gullible enough to believe that such testimonials are given without compensation, but if they are paid for, providing they are truthful, no one is deceived. The court's ruling went on to say that just because an endorser was paid did not mean their testimonial was false. As long as testimonials were truthful and the public was not misled, then there was no unfair competition. And so the FTC had no jurisdiction over paid but truthful endorsements. This was a setback for the Federal Trade Commission. And after the court's ruling, the FTC focused only on cases where the advertiser claimed it had not paid an endorser for their testimonial when it had. And some of this ruling from 1932 seems to be relevant today. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm in no way qualified to give any kind of legal advice. But my understanding is that in the US, paid endorsements do not need to be disclosed as long as consumers understand the endorser is being paid for their testimonial. You can see this in countless advertisements and commercials that feature celebrity endorsements. There's typically no mention that the endorsement has been paid for by the company because the FTC believes consumers expect celebrities to be paid in order to appear in an ad. Even before his cuticle remover was a household name, Norfam Warren decided to add more products to the Qtex line. Warren noted that his goal was not to sell consumers on a single product, but on an entirely new habit. To that end, he added five types of nail polishes. Qtex powder polish, Qtex cake polish, Qtex paste polish, Qtex stick polish, and Qtex liquid polish. At the time, many professional manicurists in the US used a cake polish, and Warren believed that cake polish was superior to liquid polish and so the company never pushed its liquid polish very hard. But in the summer of 1920, Northam Warren visited Paris, where he noticed liquid polishes were more popular than other types. He also noticed that French nail polishes were more extreme in color than those used by Americans, who had traditionally preferred a subtle pale pink. Warren believed that Americans would follow France's lead. And so, upon his return from France, Qtex liquid nail polish was reformulated, most likely using nitrocellulose, the same material found in automobile paints. The new liquid nail polish was introduced in a deep rose shade in the mid-1920s. The vibrant color shocked the country. Critics called it loud, vulgar, and garish. But despite the outcry, Qtex's rose liquid nail polish caught on very quickly particularly with flappers, who were eager to push against the fashion status quo. Two years later, a coral shade was added. Every time Qtex added a new, deeper color, stores complained, people will never wear it. But the new color would sell nonetheless. And less than a decade later, the company had eight different shades, all of which were variations of pink and red. Now consumers can match their nails to an outfit, occasion, mood, or even a lipstick. In 1934, Qtex introduced a line of corresponding lip colors to complement its nail polishes. As more colors became available, manicuring and painting one's nails was no longer simply emblematic of good hygiene, but of personal taste and self-expression. 
By 1935, the Norpam Warren Corporation was set to do 92% of the nail polish business of the world and 72% of all nail polish advertising. The company had been a pioneer in the field of nail products and essentially had a monopoly for more than a decade. But other brands were gaining traction, most notably Revlon. After years of having essentially only one supplier, retail stores welcomed and encouraged the competition. With more options available to consumers, Qtex watched its leadership position in the industry slip away. In 1960, Norpam Warren sold his company to Chesabro Pond, who was known for making Vaseline and Pond's cream. Over the years, the Qtex brand has exchanged hands many times, most recently being purchased by its former rival Revlon. The brand has never regained its original market leadership, but the Qtex line is still available today, including a cuticle remover, the product that started it all. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the history of Qtex. I've never been particularly good at painting or taking care of my nails, but I love all the incredible nail designs and art people create. If you like this video and would like to hear me talk about the history of other ordinary things, please consider giving this video a like and subscribing to my channel below. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.